Hello out there. This is former sports entertainment. No. Pro wrestling. No. Former WWF slash WWE referee Jimmy Corderas. And you're listening to Mike and Tyler on Count It Out. This episode of Count It Out with Mike and Tyler is provided by Cottage Spring. Well, we are live, pals. Welcome once again to a beautiful edition of the Bill After Seal of Approved, counted out with Mike and Tyler, provided as always by Goddard Springs. Of course, this time uh, there is no Tyler because um, it's part two of our Canada Day, show, Canada Day show, and I told him to go away because I'm not allowed to do Canada Day shows anymore, so I have invited one of the best Canadians I know to do part two of the Canada Day uh, special where I'm going to do a list. I, he doesn't know I'm doing this. He has no idea that I'm sabotaging oh, no. Canada today. He thinks I'm doing uh, best hometown heroes. But no, I'm taking over Canada today. I'm doing a Canada list with a little twist. We'll talk about that in a minute. But until we get there, let's introduce our very good friend, Mr. Max Zuckram. How you doing, Maddie? I'm doing well. Happy Canada Day to you. Well, I guess for the listeners, it'll be happy belated Canada Day. Yeah. I heard I heard your last episode, so you guys were like, well, we're either four days ahead or four days late. So Exactly. <laughs> so I figured let's sandwich it, man. Let's uh let's put some podcast bread around that uh the meat of the of Canada Day. And uh as we sit as we're recording this, Canada Day is tomorrow. I don't know if you can hear that. I'm sitting at my cottage uh, up in the Kawarthas, and, and there's literally fireworks going off right outside uh, where I'm sitting. So uh, you might hear some, you might hear some, uh, some popping noises. No, I'm not getting shot at. Uh, though, if Tyler finds out what I'm doing today, he might come by to try to shoot me. Uh, we're doing some. Ex- it's going to be Austin uh, entering Pillman's home all over again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're going to do something a little weird today. Um, for the first time, and I promise not the last time, we're going to break the code and we're going to go outside the wrestling realm. We are going to talk about a little bit of wrestling before before that. We're going to do the uh, the punch out of the week, of course. But when we get to the list, we're changing the format. We are going to do our very first ever music list on this show. And this is something we've talked about doing for a long time. Um and we plan on doing it again in the future. We're going to be bringing on, we've been in talks with Sean Gibson to come on to do a tragically hit li- a, a tragically hip list. I've been in chats with uh, Danny, good friend Danny Parkhill, to come on to do a 90s hip hop list. Um, oh boy, but, that could yeah. get... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that might be our last show ever. <laughs> I was going to say, Danny, if you don't know, Danny talking about anything. Thing. <laughs> could get you in trouble Danny talking about hip hop although he did get to meet Snoop Dogg a couple weeks ago he did he hung out with right? Snoop Dogg and one of my favorite Canadian rappers uh, Mercules who was opening for Snoop on that tour uh, so for those who don't know Danny works at the uh, what, I Canadian don't know, Tire Center it? Canadian Tire I was going to call it oh, the no. Center no you're right it's Canadian Tire Center Yes, it think, is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I still, I still call it the Corral Center. They, uh, so he works there in their entertainment something, whatever, and he gets to uh, mingle with a lot of celebrities that come in and out. And he got to hang out with one of the OG Snoop Dogg. I, I hope he asked Snoop Dogg if he wanted to come on the show to to do that episode with us. I, I, I don't know where we are with that, but that'd be really cool. <laughs> Today, however, we are doing something cool. Since it is Canada Day, we're going to do the top seven, what I consider to be, I'm not even saying greatest, my favorite albums, my most influential albums to come out of the 1990s from Canadian artists. Why are we doing and 1990s? Right there, and right What's there is why Tyler's going to hate it. Yeah. Because it's your favorite. Yeah, he not hates what favorites. Yeah, best, yeah, yeah. Right? Well... <laughs> It's so subjective. Come on. Well, I when I did my research, do you know how many weird indie albums came up 
that I've never even heard of. I've been looking. I've been yeah. looking at them over the last little while. And I'm like, I, I, I've never heard of Listen, some of these at all. I'm a much, I'm a much music kid. And that's why we're doing nineties <laughs> because right. I grew up my formative years. I, I, I know you're, you're a bit uh, younger than me, Matt. So I don't know what years you consider to be your formative years, but my, what I consider my formative years, my real Jesus, um, years where I became who I was going to be. I consider that 94 to 99. You know what I mean? Those, those are those years, like 13 to 18. Those are, those are those years where I really became who I was going to end up being eventually. And I know you're a lot like me, Matt, where music is the soundtrack to your life. Like you, you do nothing without music. Music's very important to you. And during that time, music helped shape who I am and who, I'm, who I was going to be. I was a big much music kid, big much music kid. I spent a lot of time watching uh, watching much music. So you're not going to see a whole lot of those underground album stuff on my sh- on, on this list today because it's going to be the stuff that formed me during the '90s, the stuff that I saw much music. Um, the other criteria is it has to be an album that was good uh, that I considered to be good from beginning to end. Almost no skip tracks. Still to this day, 25 years later, that I can still sit down and listen from beginning to end. There's going to be a couple albums. I can think of one off the top of my head. I'm going to get a lot of heat for for leaving off the list because they're going to say, oh, it's one of the greatest albums of all time. Where I'm going to say, yeah, it's got five amazing singles. And when that's when those singles are gone, I, I don't listen to the rest of the album. There's going to be a few albums like okay. that. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna rip a huge band-aid off. There's gonna be a bunch of albums like that, and I can get the heat later. I'm gonna rip a huge band-aid off. We're not talking about Jagged Little Pill today. While I think it's a f- I know wow. While I do think it's a phenomenal album, and I think the singles are fantastic. Outside of the singles, I, I find it ve- I find it to be very skippable. Where the other seven albums we're gonna be talking about have no skip tracks for me. That's crazy. Again, mostly because like again, I, I've been reading over some other people's lists of like top albums by Canadians or top mm-hmm. albums of the '90s, and Jagged Little Pill, man, that's <laughs> that's, a, I, that's a I banger according to all these lists. But you're right; and they've got yeah, like her her most well known songs, I'd say, came off this album. Yes, but you take away those those well known songs, you take away the you ought to knows and the ironics. <laughs> You take away those. What are you left with on that album? You can you name anything that that you that can you hum anything? Can you sing anything? Probably not. I don't even think it's her best album front to back. To be perfectly honest, I really don't. So we won't be talking about Jack and Little Pill. I'll tell you what else we're not talking about. Ready for some heat? We will not be talking about the tragically hip today. For one main reason, not because I don't believe they belong on the list because we will eventually be doing a tragically hip list. And I feel like if I give away what my favorite tragically hip album of the nineties is, it's going to give away my list in the future. Sure. So got to leave some suspense for the other list. <laughs> exactly. Just like back in the day when, um, when they did, uh, we have the five and, uh, Adam and Kent, I believe it was, did a, did a list of the greatest managers who aren't Bobby or Heenan. Bobby Heenan, <laughs> yeah. because they because because just including Bobby Heenan just gives the whole list away, right? So that's what I'm doing. It's the greatest albums in the '90s by Canadian artists who aren't the tragically hit, because it's kind of <laughs> yeah, you know what my number one is going to be. Now, here's my question before we uh, before we get into the rest of the show. Your 90s music knowledge, where are you? Your Canadian music knowledge, where are yeah, you? Yeah, like a lot of it is in passing, right? Because, I, I mean, I was born in 89. Right. Uh, and, like, so I grew up with my cousins being more influenced by more pop stuff and mm. then some early 90s rap stuff. Um, And then I really didn't get into, like, 90s rock or and then '80s rock until I was a little bit older for sure. So, which is funny because I almost uh, feel like you skipped that decade because when I first met you, 
I remember the two the two bands used to talk about most were Guns N' Roses and My Chemical Romance. Yep. You just you just there you go. the 90s completely. You went from the 80s to the 2000s, you know? Well, <clears throat> yeah. Um because I mean, yeah, and then then I did get this started to get into, but again, a lot of the bands I really liked were starting to have way more commercial success towards the end of the '90s. So like, Lincoln Park and and The Offspring, right? Mm-hmm. Like those That's right. those bands were 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 starting to get way more popular in the 2000s than than the <laughs> '90s. Sure. So yeah, so um, but having worked at a radio station uh for a good That's part right. of my life, right? Uh, I got to you know, dive into a lot of, a lot of stuff from a lot of different eras and a lot of different genres. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of it, uh, did revolve around country music, but, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> there might be a country album on, uh, on your list. I, I wouldn't be surprised we'll, if there was we'll, one. We'll, we'll find out, man. <laughs> but yeah. I think, uh, I think, I think some country. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I will. Um, yeah, it's funny actually. When last week's episode, when uh, you guys were talking about the the Toby Keith quote, and I I knew exactly what it was, and Tyler was butchering it the whole time. So I was like, as soon as I pull into the parking lot, I'm texting him the quote. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, I'll uh, I'll be able to hang with you. I think um, you might throw some curveballs you, at me that I'll have to do some uh, quick research on. But yeah, it's funny. A lot of my musical influence is. 80s rock and then 2000s yeah uh alt rock i guess if you want to put a title on it so yeah and then uh, yeah there's yeah some some 90s hip-hop 90s rap but right again like more like again later 90s or into 2000s dr dre jay-z mm-hmm. eminem yeah like that kind of stuff so yeah we'll see this could be <laughs> interesting I, th- I think it will be one more piece of criteria before we uh, get to the punch of the week. And this d- goes directly to a guy I'm sure isn't listening, but it doesn't matter. Andrew Kent, I want you to hear this loud and proud. There will be no rush on my list. No rush on my list. So we have no variety. <laughs> Good pull. What a great reference right there. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. Um, I gave you the the duty, the 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 esteem today to uh, to do the punch of the week. Are you ready for that? I think so. I, I mean, you guys have done an awesome job getting your first sponsor. I'm so proud of you guys for that, and uh, I'm I'm honored to uh, to bring you the punch out of the week this week. All right, guys. Well, let's throw right to it. Here is the Cottage Springs punch out of the week and now the cottage springs punch out of the week find your favorite flavors at cottagesprings.ca i acknowledge that you are not my tribal chief oh look at that i just went through a table (laughs) paul heyman closing out smackdown by being sent to the hospital i mean we assume being sent to the hospital but man that was um talk about going in a new direction talk about trying to elevate younger talent Mm -hmm. um that was cool man that was a cool moment and i don't know because again i haven't been following it week to week so i don't know if this is something that has been building if the uh you know the bloodline or the new bloodline i guess they're called um has been kind of hinting that they don't want Heyman as part of it. I don't really know where that story is right now, but it's crazy to me that they're just like, we're doing our own thing. We want nothing to do with the Roman Reigns led yeah. bloodline, right? Because none of these, oh, oh except for, uh, except for uh, Solo Sika, right? He's the only guy that is the yes. connection, right? Exactly. It's all new guys, which is so cool. And like, this is, I guess WWE is looking at it like this is going to be our version of uh, the Bullet Club, maybe, I guess, because we have so I many know, yeah. Samoan guys that we can yeah. pick from down the li- down the lineage, right? Like, I, exactly. I think that these guys, you know, this family, 
they just keep producing high-end talent, literally and figuratively. <laughs> they keep producing high-end wrestling talent that it feels like there's going to be new guys that could come in and, and become part of the bloodline. But yeah, the punch out of the week, that moment where where Heyman gets knocked down and then put through the table. I mean, good for him. This, he, Heyman's like, what, in his mid-50s? Uh, 57 years old, I believe. Oh, man. Like, that yeah. was a hell of a bump to take. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, what a moment. What a moment to uh, to close out SmackDown. That man, um, from what I've read, he's like a method actor, as, uh, like, as far as wrestling is concerned. Apparently, so... You'll notice, like, if you look at his face the last few weeks, very swollen eyes, uh, bloodshot eyes, um, always looks like he's, a, you know, on the verge of a ne- nervous breakdown. Apparently, for a day or two before um, before SmackDown airs, he's been depriving himself of a day or two sleep. Wow. In, order to, in order to come in and have this demeanor to him. That's dedication to a story, man. Like, that's insane to me. Um, For a man to put that much dedication into not only a story that you're involved in, but a story that is focused on, like you said, focused on getting younger talent over. This is amazing stuff. But we all know it's going to eventually lead to The Rock coming back and being the real um, uh, tribal chief of this new bloodline. Of course, Roman will end up coming back with his own bloodline, who I'm assuming is going to be the reunited Usos. Maybe South, maybe, uh, maybe Sammy, uh, Sammy, whose last name escapes me. Zane. Um, thank you. I almost said Callahan and I was, couldn't spit it out. Sammy Zane. Uh, there's still other Samoans that could be featured. We'll see. Um, there's a lot they can do here. I am telling you right now, if I was to do a list of the greatest, storylines ever the bloodline storyline is in my top five because it has now been been going on for like what two three years and there's no reason to stop it because it keeps because it keeps reinventing itself you know they're they they, 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 like like paul Heyman is very famous for saying people will ask him what inning are we in paul and paul used to say you think we're in the 12th inning we're in the fourth we're not even close (laughs) And and he was right. I, I I don't even think they're in the sixth inning right now. Like this is this is insane. There's so much to do with this storyline. So so farther to go. And if all them smart marks and and whiny bitchy wrestling fans don't like it, go go watch whatever's on TNT. I don't fucking care. I don't know what there isn't to like. Right. I, you know. Uh... Your your uh, TNA insider Adam Conton and I got together to watch the um, NXT pay per view that happened just a couple of weeks ago, mostly because we want to see the Jordan Grace match. Of course, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? But uh, you know we were watching it, and now I'm, I'm I forget their names now, but there are a couple of guys on there that I had never seen before. And I was mm-hmm. like, man, these guys are good. And I just said to him, I'm like, man, wrestling's like in a really good spot now. Like there's Thank so you. much to pick from. And like, if there's something you don't like, there's something else out there. And and I also said like, it's pretty um, amazing to see that like a, something like NXT that I know people have been down on for a while, but it seems like it's starting to build its way back up again producing high-end talent like you know 10 maybe not 10 15 years ago now um unless you were in an independent promotion like roh or something like that you were never getting this kind of pay-per-view time that t uh that nxt is promoting now right and it was like it's a it was a three-hour show with like seven matches on it, there was there was way too much in between matches um, promo material mm-hmm. for people that weren't even on the show. For my liking, I was like, yeah. okay, there's way too many commercials on here. Sure. Uh, outside of that, though, uh, that they they had a women's uh, ladder match, um, and like I said, there were a couple of uh, other matches on there that I was very, very impressed with. Um, again, like just just going to say that, like if if 
if the bloodline storyline is something you're not enjoying on SmackDown, there's so much other stuff out there that you can go and indulge in. Jump over the raw, watch watch Uncle Howdy, man, because uh, he's because he's that doing too. some cool shit too. You know, WWE is doing some awesome, awesome things under the Triple H era. Uh, I am not an AEW, AEW fan, but I'm sure there are many things in AEW to enjoy. TNA is doing several things to enjoy, and if you don't like the three major corporations, the this is the greatest time to be an independent wrestling fan in history. There's so many phenomenal indies out there like MLW, GCW, you know, the, the list goes on. IWTV has hundreds of different promotions all at the tip of your fingers. This is without a doubt the best time in history to be a wrestling fan. I, I absolutely love it. It really is. It really is. Yeah. And with with uh, that, we, we've we we've never given out the... Uh, the punch of the week to uh, to a guest of the show before. I knew I put it in good hands. You uh, you picked a perfect punch out this <laughs> week, my friend. Now, before we get into the list, we are still a wrestling show. Let's chat some wrestling. Matt, the one uh, the one thing you and I have had big time in common over the last couple of years is uh, we became pretty big Impact fans. Um, you and That's I got right. to, you know, you and I don't get to see each other in person a lot these days. And, uh, we got to hang out last year and go to sacrifice in, in Windsor, which was very, very cool. Possibly. I think the first wrestling show you and I ever actually attended together, which was a TNA show. That so wasn't kind of cool. like a, a, a North Bay show. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. That wasn't like an indie yeah. show. Yeah. So, so that, that was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, we both continue to watch the product. So let's talk a little TNA right now. Some of the stuff that they're doing including the amazing work that they're doing right now involved with NXT and the WWE. Um, what was your thoughts when, when, when Jordan Grace first popped out on, uh, on NXT a few weeks ago? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I, I really like, like for how long being a WWE fan, were you also supposed to like ignore yeah. the competition, right? Like, you know, we were just talking about how, it's a great time to be a wrestling fan because you have all these other options, but back, you know, it, back uh, in the nineties and even into the two thousands, you were supposed to act or the WWE wanted you to act like they were the only place you could get wrestling from. Um, and now it's really cool. And I know AEW did this, started to do this a little bit more like right from the get go when they start inviting um, indie wrestlers that still had, championship titles with their current promotion onto their show i mean deanna yeah. perrazzo was uh knockouts champion and or maybe she was ring of honor champion but she had she had a bit of a run in AEW. Th yeah. this was like two years ago now i think yeah, before um, she signed with the, yeah yeah so yeah so to see uh jordan grace come out and um and uh be more than just a uh one segment wonder kind of thing like the fact that they actually put her into a title program going into mm -hmm. nxt battleground huge like i think that's huge yeah. i think that's awesome that wwe is open to doing that like they they sort of teased it even when um vince was still there right they had but it was mickey james was yes. in the women's Royal rumble, but yes, it was it, it, Mickey James was in the women's rumble as the TNA knockouts champion, yeah. but she was also a known commodity to Vince. McMahon, exactly. Right? Like yeah. Jordan Grace has never appeared on, at least from my knowledge, I don't think she's ever been. And she certainly has never had the kind of success that Mickey James has had in the WWE. Right. So, well, no, uh, but Vince, Vince was always kind of, against talent that he did not create in his own yeah. mind you know so he, no he, you're right he would have never done what triple h is doing right now with, with jordan grace um triple h is very open triple h and i should give some credit to Shawn michaels because Shawn michaels is running nxt both these men are very okay with acknowledging the success that these wrestlers have outside of the wwe bubble which i think yeah. is great and the Honestly. fact that 
I was going to say they, they let her wrestle as Jordan Grace, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how, like even, even a guy like Kevin Owens wasn't allowed to be Kevin Steen. Right? You right. Know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> On so, the same night, and well, the same can be said about all these new uh, Bloodline members, right? Uh, Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa, Jacob Fatu. Fatu, all got, yeah. All, all got to keep the, their, their indie names. <laughs> Not um, Rikishi Jr. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what I loved about uh, the, if you want to call it, debut of Jordan Grace on NXT television was, number one, nobody saw it coming. It was such a well-kept secret. Nobody yeah. knew she was there. And that was one of two surprises that night because Ethan Page made his debut later that night as well, which is the second thing that I love the most about this whole thing is that Jordan uh, Jordan Grace was able to outshine the debut of Ethan Page because I hate Ethan Page so very, very, very much. So to see him outshined by somebody phenomenal like Jordan Grace makes me so happy. Well, oh. Trick Williams did beat him for the mm-hmm. uh, the NXT Championship at Battleground, right? Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Jordan Grace lost, but... Uh, but what they also did, and and I, like I said, I watched this with Adam, and uh, Ash by Elegance uh, interfered in the match, mm-hmm. yeah. right? And he's like, well, what's smart is she called out Jordan Grace on, um, on Impact um, just before Battleground happened. So it kind of set up yes, exactly. their storyline. Yeah. And now I believe that they are in a program together and yeah, uh, they're going to they're play going, slam anniversary slam anniversary exactly which yeah. is great for great for ash by elegance i think it's a great character not not a big fan of her manager to be perfectly honest uh but uh uh but i do like her i think she's a phenomenal uh i liked her in wwe too i always thought she was good i think she got enough uh, credit but uh but what's great is they allowed a tna storyline build on an nxt show yes, yes. and I, I do like the, the fact that they they reciprocated the favor jordan came over and lost a match for the nxt title but then they sent an nxt person over to a, a tna pay-per-view to fight for the knockout championship and she lost right so yeah. that was so, right so, so so fair is fair and i like that when you think about this, though, it was only, what, 15 years ago when Robbie McAllister got fired from WWE for sitting in the crowd at a TNA show? You know what I mean? We've come right. we've come a long way since yeah. those days. And again, it's very, it's very, you, you see it go back and forth throughout the history, right? Like back in the late 80s or mid to late eighties, like WWE had a pretty good working relationship with new Japan or whatever the promotion was called in Japan Um, at the time. Yeah. No, it would have been new Japan at that point. Uh, I believe they had, um, I believe they had some dealings with all Japan as well, but mostly new Japan. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, and then they also were really, trying to help ecw along i mean depending on who you believe about financials and whatever but um you know rob van dam has had some matches on raw before he was mr monday night right like um yeah uh, right so they they had a pretty decent working relationship and um but then all of a sudden you, you know you hit the year 1999, I guess. And then it's like, no, ECW yeah. doesn't exist anymore. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think this is, this is really cool. This is a really neat time to, again, be a wrestling fan because of the choice out there, but also it's like, Oh, now I kind of have to pay attention to, to right. everything else to like, see who these people are and see who, who might be 100%. showing up. Right. And, and again, like, you know, it's just not just TNA. About- it's yeah, you and Tyler TNA. talked about it last week with uh, with Joe Hendry showing up mm. um, on NXT, and uh, Frankie Kazarian was there as well, right? So yes. it's it's really cool that uh, um, if you know guys from one promotion, they might show up on another promotion, and it's not like they're jumping ship per se, but it is you know they're they're being allowed to showcase their talent to a different audience. And remember, the next NXT pay-per-view is coming from our backyard of Toronto. There's a uh, 
There's a certain boy, I believe he calls Toronto home. His name is Josh Alexander. That's right. If he doesn't show up at that pay per view, I'd be very surprised. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying. Maybe he'll, maybe. Yeah. And, and and remember that his former tag team partner, who he held the longest reigning um, TNA tag team championships of all time with, Ethan Page, will be in the main event. For him to come out and pick a fight with Ethan Page on an XT pay per view in Toronto, that is yeah. money to me. That is yeah. money. Come on. That is, yeah. Do you think it needs the match needs to happen, or do you think uh, there needs to be a confrontation? No, if they're if they're gonna tease it, do it. it doesn't have to happen right away. So you can tease it for a while, mm-hmm. but you got to mm-hmm. get there. Yeah, you got to get there eventually. Awesome. Yeah, I uh, no, I like it. It and again, like I said, it it makes you think. Uh, you got to pay attention to different um, different promotions and that. Again, they're they're not saying you have to only watch us to get what's going on. Exactly. All right, bud, you uh, ready to jump in a time machine here? Let's do it. We're gonna go. We're gonna go back a couple decades. We're gonna get back to the nineteen nineties. We are not gonna talk about wrestling for the rest of this show. We are going to the world of music, and we are talking about the greatest albums of the uh, uh, made by Canadian artists from the years nineteen ninety through nineteen ninety nine. And I couldn't be more excited. Um, now, obviously, when you're, I don't know if you created yourself a, a list or not, Matt. But when we're, when we're done this, feel free to, to either uh, list off your list or uh, hit me with as many honorable mentions as you can. But we're going to start with my number seven. Uh, remember, the criteria for this is it had to be a, an album that really got me through the 90s. And it has to be an album that is a banger from beginning to end. And I consider this to be a banger from beginning to end. We are starting with Big Rex in Loving Memory. Okay. Now, do you have a lot of memory of this album, Matt? I don't. You don't? Um, okay. Uh, not a huge Big Rex not- guy. I know All some right. of the... And, and you know what? Some Neither am I for the most singles, part, but this... But- this album, though, this is their first album, and I think it's uh, it's their best album. It's the only album I truly love. But uh, to this to this day, I still like uh, this album came out in nineteen ninety seven, and I still put it on and sing it from beginning to end. Uh, three extremely strong singles: uh, "The Oaf," "That Song," and "Blown Wide Open." Even if you're not a, a big Rec fan, everybody knows that song. Every- Everybody knows that one for sure. Everybody knows that song. And Blown Wide Open, I feel like it got popular enough that, like, yeah, if you threw it on, even if, yeah, again, if you said, like, you don't know Big Wreck is, but you put that song on and people were like, okay, I've heard this. Yeah. And like, as I, I think that... Blown Wide Open had enough commercial success that people should know that one. For sure. I mean, this album, just the first five tracks alone, you get the oaf, that song, look what I found, blow it open, and how could you know? Like, just the beginning of this album is enough to be like, okay, we have something. Then the rest of the album just does it. Songs like Waste, By the Way, and the amazing uh, Closer and um, uh, Overemphasizing. Um, Ian Thorley is amazing on the guitar, but he's one hell of a a lyricist. Um, He's got a hell of a vocal range. I just a phenomenal album uh, from beginning to end, as far as I'm concerned. My awesome. Yeah, six... Again, those are three. Those are three really well-known songs. Yeah. Um, by a band that probably, I, I don't know, uh, probably deserves to have a little more love in in Canadian music. Um, tremendous, yeah, tremendous vocals, and they they certainly have range. Like those are three very different sounding songs. Oh yeah. That that opening to the oaf, that 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 weird like, doo, 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 like like nobody sounded like that at that point in time. It's very cool. Uh great way to open the album, too. My number six, I feel is an extremely underrated album. I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't know anything off this album, to be perfectly honest. Uh you'll know the band. You just may not know this particular album, but I do think it's their best album. Um, this album came before their massive popularity as a pop punk group 
they weren't doing so much pop punk at this point, but they would get there eventually. We're talking about Treble Charger and their band and their and and their album Maybe It's Me from 1997. Okay, I'm no, gonna Trouble have Charger. to look up what was on this uh, album. Trouble Charger would get really famous later on with uh, songs like American Psycho and and uh, 100 Million and stuff like that. When they really got into, uh, they were sounding more like Gob and, and Blink-182 and Sum 41. You know, they, yeah. but, bef but before that, this album is almost, this, this is almost an indie album. Like it's more of a rock album than it is a punk album or a pop punk album. Um, only two singles off it, uh, two beautiful singles though, friend of mine and the haunting, uh, ballad red, uh, two amazing songs on this album, but then, you know, ever she flows forever knowing takes me down, uh, left feeling odd, how she died, all tremendous songs that put this album together as really a piece of art before they got i'm not going to say they sold out or or they went too mainstream but <laughs> but, but but before they got very Dang, mainstream man yeah that their their sound definitely changed this was more of an indie sound before they got into the you know the realm of of american psycho so um, why why this one sticks for you like what, where when do you remember first hearing this album and when you know it's got 13 songs on it. Oh, I... um, none of them are tremendously long songs. They all nope. fit within that three and a half to four and a half minute range. And um feels like it's a pretty quick album to get through. I first heard the, their first single, Friend of Mine, uh, it had played on Much Music one night. And I really dug it. Um, this is some point in 1997. And I really, really enjoyed the song. And uh, I had a habit back then of... Um, constantly recording everything anything and everything i could off much music on the vhs okay because <laughs> uh, i was obsessed with music videos i loved music videos it's still an art that i think is completely lost now um i i'm with you man I they love used music to videos. okay this is and this is gonna date me a bit but um much music had a countdown show and then ytv also had a countdown the, <laughs> music the hit countdown list show. The hit list. Thank you. With, I couldn't remember what it was called. Yes, the Tar hit with, list. Uh, hosted by Tarzan Dan. Yeah. Yes. And I uh, I loved watching both of them because, again, not just for the music, but I thought the good music videos told a story or they enhanced that, that's the song, right? So, I yeah, I loved I, – I completely get what you're saying with that. Well, to, to answer your question, a few weeks after um, I first saw a friend, the friend of my video, they released a video for the song uh, for the song Red, which to this day is still one of my favorite songs. I fell in love with it right away. And the very next chance I got, um, I lived, you, you have an idea of where I grew up, but I grew up in a town of fucking less than a thousand people, yeah. no, mu no music stores, no that shit. So to buy an album, I had to wait till my parents wanted to go to two two towns over to to little dirt mall over there where the one and only music store was. So I'd have to wait a couple months, go there, and I tracked down this album and bought it and never looked back. Uh, based on those two those two singles alone, and and, uh, and and it's still in heavy rotation to this day. That's awesome. I'm gonna jump on a tiny soapbox here and talk about like this is why local radio and canadian owned television is so important to the music scene because not everybody lives in fucking toronto yeah. where there's 8,000 HMV stores around the corner it's a little different these days because yes. of the internet yes right and I get that. I get that. But, I know people will be like, oh, radio, go yell at a cloud, Matt. Like, I get it. But <laughs> like, I think just to kind of put it in perspective, like much music and 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 local radio are really those were those driving forces that bands like Trouble Charger may never have gotten to the ears of Mike Walsh. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. There's something just really nice and nostalgic about it and just just kind of highlights the importance of 
why we should support Canadian made content across all mediums. I could not agree with you more. Do you know the only thing bigger than Christmas to me when I was a kid was the one time a year my dad would take us to Toronto for 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 a weekend and he would bring me to Sam's the record man. There you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That was like fuck HMV, fuck CD <laughs> world. It was all about Sam the record man for me back in the day, which uh, unfortunately no longer exists. But for for those who are too young to remember what that was, it was a store in Toronto that was like the mecca of record stores. That's right. Yeah, it was huge, and there was nothing you couldn't but find. They not there. have bands come in and and play yes. there, and they would have yes. like autograph yeah. sessions and stuff there mm-hmm. too. Like, yeah, yeah. amazing anyway, stuff off the soapbox. But <laughs> <laughs> moving on to my number five, we're we're going back. We're going to another band. By the way, I didn't say this in the beginning. No band can show up here twice. Okay. Okay. I should have said that. Before. Okay. Mm, or, okay. Or, or else we might get <clears throat> multiple bands by certain artists. I decided not yeah. to go that way. Okay. Okay. I, I should have said that right from the beginning. Because you're probably thinking already, well, how come this whole list hasn't been so-and-so? You know? <laughs> well, yeah. There's a, reason, there's a reason why. Um, We're going to my number six. And this is a band that I got onto very, very, very early in their career on this album. I'm sorry, before this album, when their name was still the Rainbow Butt Monkeys. <laughs> okay, I thought you might be bringing these guys up. They would, of course, go on to change their name to Finger Eleven. Their debut album is my number six, and that is Tip. Now, this was hard for me okay. because, well, actually, it's not hard for me because it's the only album they had in the 90s. But it's yeah, b- b- because Greatest Blue Skies came out in 2000. However, this album um, is, I think it, even if Greatest Blue Skies was in the 90s, I think this would still do it for me because this album is so different than anything else they've ever done. They never went yeah. back to sounding like this. This was their original sound and they, and they got heavier, then they got softer, then they got more radio friendly, they got more ballad then they got really weird, then they went back to heavy, which is all cool for them. Do whatever you want to do as a band. But this sound right here, this guttural, really raw sound they had on tip, um, which really elevated them because the story behind Finger Eleven they won when they were still the Rainbow Bomb Monkeys. They won uh, some band of the Battle of the Bands, I believe that was hosted through much music. And the winner got um, money to produce their first album, which for them was an album called Letters to Chutney. Great album, by the way. Uh, good luck ever finding it. It hasn't been uh, printed in years, but it's a great album. Then they changed their name. They revamped themselves. They changed their look, changed their sound. Came up with this album with the money that they made from selling Letters to Chutney. And they came up with this. And right away, they're coming out with, I believe their very first single was Above. And that set the tone for the, for, for, for what this band was going to be. Um, th- 20, what, what are we, this album came out in 99, I want to say, maybe 98. So 97. Tw- was it 97? So 25 years 97. later, I'm, I'm still telling you, this album has not depreciated in quality whatsoever. I can listen to their, for example, their, um, their self-titled album, which is their third album. It's got songs I loved in the beginning. When they first came out, don't get me wrong, man. One thing, Banger of a of a ballad. If I hear it now, I'm switching it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I can say that about a good handful of their songs. Paralyzer. I'm I'm switching it. All right. There's not a single song I'm skipping on tip. Not a single song. Um, so they when when did you end up getting into Figure Eleven and, and did Tip hit your radar back then? So that's the funny thing is I thought Finger Eleven was their first album. That's their third so, album. Wow. So then I'm like, I got to get into more of 
what these guys are. And yeah. then I hear some songs from Tip, and I was just like, "This isn't Finger Eleven to me." Right? Yeah. I right. Got that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just again, reading through some stuff real quickly here. They say that this album was like inspired by Tool or influenced by Tool. Uh, I can see Jimmy Black being a big, uh, big Tool fan. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. Like to me. Finger Eleven is is more of those uh, two albums between 2003 and 2007. You know, fin- okay. the Finger Eleven album, and then them versus you versus me. Like those to me is sure. what in and my such mind a is drastically different Eleven. sound, and it is completely yeah. different. Like it's, it's funny. Like I can put Finger the Finger Eleven album on and not skip any of those songs. Like I right. love Other Light, Stay in Shadow, Absent Element. Like that is uh complicated questions. I think that album is so good. Like if you were doing this of like the from the 2000 to 2010, I think this album would be on there for me. Um, because wow. I like this album that much. Um, but yeah, such a different sound from from their their earlier, earlier stuff. Now our American fans, our American listeners are going to think I'm cheating here, but I'm not. All right. Because my next album, album number four, was released in the United States in 2001. But okay. You guys, but you guys suck because we got it in September of 1999. This just made the list. It just okay. made the list. And I remember when it first came out, when that first single load me up hit us i'm talking about beautiful midnight by matthew good okay um i may have lied i don't know if the first single was load me up or, or hello time bomb but hello time bomb too like like that 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 hit right away um this was this was hard for me because i really like matthew good and i like the majority of his albums it was hard for me okay. to pick which one i thought was the best but I think this one really is because if you if you if you look at the track listening, "Hello Time Bomb," "Giant," um, "I Miss New Wave," "Strange Days," "Blow Me Up," "Suburbia," uh, "Going All the Way," "A Boy Is a Machine Gun," "The Future Is X Rated," "Born to Kill." It's insane. This album is just hit That's after hit after hit after hits. hits. Yeah, yeah. There's so much good stuff on this album. Like if you if you were to see uh, Matt Good live these days. Um, or like if you just check out his the album he did uh, live at Massey Hall a few years ago, he plays Is it basically 50% just of this album. This? Yeah. Because yeah. there's so many good songs off this album. <laughs> you know? Um, were you a big Matt Good fan in the 90s or, or, or at all in I, your life? Or? I mean, I like his I like his singles for sure. Yeah. Uh never really got huge into them, but like, yeah, he's <laughs> He always had a sound that's like you you hear it come on and you're just like oh I gotta listen to this. <laughs> you know? That and like you know he, right you know right away it's not you. good. Yeah. It hooks 100%. you, right? And yeah, so he's th- that's a band that I probably need to give way more time and attention to. He really was the king of um of big shiny tunes too. I believe he had a song <laughs> on like the first like four oh, big my- shiny tunes albums. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's right. Well, that's I right. feel like yeah, I'm not winning. I feel like I'm not winning over to... Matt quite yet. But uh, but hopefully let's get him on the top three. I don't know how you feel about this band, uh, Matt, but I'm I, I'm I'm hoping your artistic side is ready to come out a bit because this band, <laughs> okay. this band, this band. That's the only way to to describe this band is artistic. They are, I got to see them live in 2001, and it was one of the coolest thing I ever got to witness. This album was ranked number 435 in Hard Rock Magazine's book, The 50, 500 Greatest Rock Albums of All Time. Now, 435 doesn't sound very good, but that's 500 out of how many rock albums in history? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's damn good. This came out in 1999, and we are talking about the triptych from the Tea Party. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Yes, Tea Party is a band um that I quite enjoy. Um yeah. Yeah, you got it right with this one for sure. Not that you've gotten it wrong with the other ones, but uh yeah, even, this is even uh, if you even if you don't know the full album the way I do, just the singles alone, Heaven Coming Down, The Messenger, uh yeah, these these living arms. Uh, I believe "Touch" was a single as well. "Touch" is um, on there. "Touch" is the lead song on this album, actually. That, that, that's right. Um, and then and then you have other "Slight Attack" is a phenomenal album. "Chimera" is a is a ph- phenomenal song. Um, the closing track "Gone" is really really good. It's a beautifully done album. If you really sit down and listen to it, I want to call it. I want to say it's probably a uh, concept album. That's what it, it's got that feeling of, of a story album. If you, if you want to look into it that deep, I don't know what the story is, but it, it has that feeling of it. But um, <laughs> man, they, this band, they, they're enigmas. They really are. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're strange creatures. They're, 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 art, they're artists more than they are musicians. Um, I absolutely love this album. Great album. Um, just reading through some stuff quickly, like uh, Rock Hard, the, the German music magazine gave it nine out of ten stars. Uh, yeah. All Music Source, an American online music database which catalogs more than three million album entries, they gave it four and a half out of five stars. So that's pretty awesome for this quote unquote little Canadian band. <laughs> You right? know, to to have uh, an album like this um, again, I think it is in the storytelling of these songs that really hook you, and you're like, okay, n- now what? What's next? What mm. what else can they bring me? Yeah. Uh, great choice. This is a hell of an album. Now, my number two, uh, there's three things, three points got to make. Number one. Um, it's the oldest album on my list. Uh, we're going back back to 1993 with this one. Number two, I think it's the first and only album on the list that Tyler's finally going to go, finally, what I write. I guarantee <laughs> it. And um, it's the one that uh, gives you props for uh, for a little bit of predicting because it's the first and uh, and only country album on my on my list. Okay. Like I said, we're going back to 1993 with one of the greatest bands in Canadian history. Like, like if we're if we're just listing great Canadian bands, I think they're on my top five without without a doubt. We're doing Five Days in July by Blue Rodeo. Yeah, I thought Blue Rodeo might be on your list for sure. They have had so many stellar albums throughout the decades, mm-hmm. though, right? Like, um, yes. sort of like almost like a rock equivalent i guess to or a country equivalent to like maybe acdc right where it's like they come out with something like every couple of years and you're like oh they're yeah. still around and then they, yeah and, like, and, it, and if it's not them at the very least it's jim cuddy doing some sort of some sort of solo thing sure. like i remember i remember for a while in the uh in the early 2000s jim cuddy was touring with uh dennis DeYoung from sticks Okay. And they, and they were singing each other's songs. No way. Yeah. So, so, so you want to talk about staying relevant? Like that, that, that that's insane to me. But yeah. this album, um, Five Days in July, not to be not to be uh, mistaken with the lead uh, song off it, Five Days in May. Always confused by that. <laughs> that's um, right. But then just look at the, the rest of the hits and the rest of the, the killer songs on this album hasn't hit me yet bad timing photograph uh what is this love head over heels uh till i gain control again dark angel like this this is a stellar album and what i like was i know i called it a country album but it's kind of a country rock album right because it's got a little bit of a a rock edge to it, a little bit of a blues edge to it um jim cuddy is amazing but the rest of the band really really Puts it all together. Uh, Greg Keylor's um, uh, lyrics are phenomenal in this. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful album. Yeah, I think you're nailing this. I mean, I don't know what Tyler would be saying right now, but <laughs> this is this is the this is the first time he's going fine. 
because because I haven't talked because I haven't talked about Sam Roberts. I haven't talked about the Trues. I haven't talked about um, a bunch but of again, I, know, I know that he loves. I feel like a lot of those guys again were later into the two thousands where they had their yeah, best. Probably exactly. Um. Yeah, I don't even know if the Trues were in the were around in the nineties. I have no idea. My number one, I I almost feel shouldn't be a surprise to you or anybody, um, because not only is this the greatest Canadian record, um, except for maybe something by the Tragically Hip, who knows where that would have went, um, but uh, I think this is one of the greatest albums of the '90s. Period. Maybe one of the greatest albums ever recorded. Period. It's definitely the best album by this band, and that's saying something because they have so many good albums yeah i know exactly where you're going with this we're getting clumsy my friend this is our lady piece it it has to be right this album is phenomenal so much so that when they came out with a best of our lady piece album in 2010 sure i think it was um Basically, half of the clumsy album was on. <laughs> it, was just, it, was just, it was just a re release of Clumsy. <laughs> <laughs> and then Navid at the end. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, this is, I think, if you were to ask um, again, any any hardcore Our Lady Peace fan, any casual Our Lady Peace fan, and just say what's the first song that you can think of that, that, that you know those guys from, it'll probably be. be a song off this album and it will probably be Superman's dead or 4am or clumsy yeah. or automatic exactly. flowers. Right. Like it's like, yeah, this album, um, it's yeah. It, every single song on it is, uh, non skip worthy. Like it's so well yeah. done. So well put together. Um, I, I actually didn't not know when I first started hearing our lady piece on the radio. Um, I didn't, think that they were a canadian band because i just thought these guys yeah. are so good and not not to say that they were good they can't be good if they were canadian but like they just they just felt like they were a big band and like yeah. everybody across the world should know who these guys are they just they just had that sound they just felt that way um yeah i i i love our lady piece and i love this album and, and this is almost hard because they had three albums in the '90s, and all three albums are really good. Um, I think Navi came out in the, yeah. the '90s, right? Navi came out in '94. Did yeah. Uh, the the uh, clumsy came out in '97, and then Happiness Is Not a Fish came out in '99. Right. Uh, and all three albums are fantastic, but I to this day, 25 years later, I don't think they've beaten the quality of, of clumsy. They definitely haven't beaten the, the success of Clumsy. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking through them quickly. I know Happiness is uh not, not a fish yeah. has one man army. Yes. And that um, song was huge. That song was massive. They also right. have it also has the song uh Thief, which I personally consider a favorite of mine, uh, an absolute favorite of mine. But as a whole, it doesn't touch this album. Naveed had Naveed, obviously. Yeah. And Starseed. Uh, Starseed is Starseed. on that album. Starseed's Starseed. a banger of a song, man. Like that's a yeah. Do you know, do you know where I first heard Starseed though? It wasn't off Naveed. Oh. I first heard I first heard Starseed on the Armageddon soundtrack. Okay. If that doesn't blow you up, right? <laughs> If that doesn't put you on an American audience's radar, nothing will. Now, that's my top seven. What That's what I consider my favorite or best albums of, of the 90s. Um, there's one album that broke my heart to leave off the list. Okay. It was it was neck and neck with uh, with, with, with um, uh, Big Wreck. And that's uh, the album Silver by, by Moist. Uh, okay, creature, yeah, I I mean I mean creature could have been on there too, but silver for sure. Moi, moist in you general. Might putting a moi I, I did think you might have put a moist album on here just because I, I know how much you like them. I, I it broke my heart not to, but I just love that that album, that that big wreck album too much. 
Um, a couple of uh, honorable mentions I'll throw to you, see if you have anything. But uh, the album Twice Removed by Sloan is, is an absolute uh, killer album. Um, the band Plum Tree. Do you know the band Plum Tree? They're a bit of a... Uh, the name of sounds so thing. familiar, but like... They barely they did a, anything. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. They're they're kind of an indie thing. Uh, if you don't know them, you don't know them. Kind of deal. Uh, they had a really popular song called Scott Pilgrim back in the day, uh, okay. uh, which which was later on the guy who wrote the comic book Scott Pilgrim, uh, based the name off, off that? that off that song. Yeah. That's a great uh, piece of trivia. And, and, and that song ended up on the soundtrack for the movie Scott Pilgrim versus Amazing. The World. Yeah, uh, but they had two great albums in the 90s, uh, Mass Teen Fainting and uh, Plum, Tree, Plum, Plum Tree Predicts the Future. Uh, uh, two great albums. Um, another kind of an indie album, uh, album called Follow by The Weaker Thens. Uh, Thrush Hermit had a great album called Sweet Home Wrecker. Hawksley Workman was uh, was getting uh, going in the 90s with uh, For Him and the Girls. And um, Trouble Treasure's self-titled album was uh, was pretty good as well. Do you awesome. have Do you have any uh, any albums that we should have been talking about here today? Um, I mean, maybe not because it it is Mike's favorite list. No, yeah, no, I get it. But, but, uh, what are you, but trust me, I trust me, that's like, never stopped. That's never stopped Tyler before. Okay, you know, <laughs> to, to you know, to to throw it out to the country fans. I mean. Shania Twain's "Come On Over" was there you go. huge. Yeah. It sure, was. absolutely huge, and it has, like, I think if you're a country fan, um, it has some of her probably her best work. Um, I'm gonna pull it up because, um, I I've listened to this. You know, I remember my mom buying this album, <laughs> and like it was on in the car all the time. Uh, but yeah, it's got "Man, I Feel Like a Woman." I'm holding on to love. Don't be stupid. Coming over from this moment on, uh, that don't impress me much. That album was nothing but singles. Like, like it was just it was yeah. single after single after single after single. Back yeah. in what was it? When, 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 when did that album? When did that album come out? I want to say in ninety five or ninety seven. Ninety seven. That late. Eh? Okay, I remember that year. You couldn't. It wasn't even that year. It was probably a three year stretch where you couldn't go without hearing a Shania Twain song somewhere. You know, you turn it, you turn on yeah. the TV. I, it was, it was on CMT. She was crossing it over too. She was making 100%. country pop popular, yeah. right? Like her, it was her songs. Yeah. Would, her songs would be on, on much music when much music didn't really play country, but her, her songs would be on much music. Her songs were all over CMT. Her songs were on every radio station from the country stations to the rock stations. She was everywhere. Good, good call. Good pull. And again, you know, going back to, you know, I, I grew up in, in Thornhill and then, and then later in Brampton. So like we, we did have, um, you know, the HMVs or the sunrise, sunrise records, right. All those kinds of stories. Her poster was always up always in every single one of those stores. You know, we've got the, we got the newest Shania Twain album. Like that's, I just like, that's like vivid, right? Like, yeah. Um, so what else? Um, Bare Naked Ladies had a couple of big albums back in back in the holy 90s. shit. You're not wrong, man. Right? Like, uh, let me pull. Uh, what's what a good nuts? pull because I why I don't know why I didn't think of that. Probably again because they they were like unless you were a huge Bare Naked Ladies fan, you probably didn't love everything on their albums. Yeah. Right. So like stunt has one week, it's all been done back to back. And then the rest of the album is kind of just there. Alcohol was, was, is at six. Was stunt the nineties or, or was that in the early two thousands? 1998. Okay. And then Gordon came out in 1992. Gordon was, was that man. had Gordon, Gordon Brian was Wilson be my Yoko Ono. Yeah. If I had a million dollars. I believe that was their first album, right? Looks like it. Yeah. And then uh another They also have they also have nope. Never mind. Shut another up. great 
another great band by uh by a great Canadian artist that you really just reminded me of. Um the uh the album uh, God Shuffled His Feet by the Crash Test Dummies. Uh um, okay. Was a fan again another album. band that I probably should have been way more into than I was. Um I I'm honestly though... just looking at I'm honestly just looking at a list and uh Celine Dion had some huge albums in the 90s. <laughs> um what else? Yeah, that's probably about it. Like I'm sure people are screaming at us that we're yeah, there yeah. we're missing so. something. But again, this is you know, it's your favorites and me just trying to fill in some blanks along, <laughs> the, along the edges, but yeah, again, from what I remember for Canadians, um, yeah, Bare Naked Ladies was pretty huge. Uh, Our Lady Peace, massive. And again, Shania Twain just had that crossover. Um, so. Now then, thank you. And, and Alanis, you know, again, you said. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Alanis I, would probably be the ultimate uh, honorable mention for me. She really, yeah, she really is an honorable mention. Only because outside of those those, those singles, I, I can't name any of the other songs off the album. Another one more honorable mention, the album uh, "Scenery," the album "Scenery and Fish," excuse me, by I Mother Earth. Okay, um, it, it had like uh, one more astronaut on it, and uh, uh, "Shortcut to Moncton," uh, three days old. Uh, really good album. The, th those guys, I don't think, got enough uh, enough play back in the day. They really didn't, um, and they're good. Like. <laughs> Like, they're, they're really good really good especially back in that era but uh because back then uh during that era their their singer was still um edwin uh before edwin went off to do his weird solo project thing okay um, and and then they got a new singer uh but uh i don't remember what i was gonna say next but that that era of i mother earth was was my favorite for sure yeah yeah, I like a lot of their stuff. Again, this is a band that I don't think I probably ever sat down and put an album on. Um, again, like for, you know, you're talking about your formative years. For me, it was, I would jump from that 80s rock, that hair metal rock, right? Like yeah. listening to like Appetite for Destruction. And then the very next thing I would put on is like Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> which makes a lot of sense you know what you're going from the hair metal so you're wearing the makeup already so then you're jumping to the emo That's shit right. <laughs> so no matter and what you're keeping going from this yeah. to this yeah. <laughs> man we 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 could well we won't but we could uh you and i together could do it could do a guns and roses list because you're the only guy i know that likes guns and roses as much as i can as much as i do <laughs> Uh, no, I shouldn't say as much. Mm -hmm. Definitely more, because you're the only person I know that likes Ch Chinese democracy as an album. <laughs> That's a sleeper album. Oh, my God. I, I'll never forget when it came out, and I had just started working with you, and you're like, you know, I really like this. I remember going, fuck, I thought, was gonna, I, I thought it was going to... I thought it was going to like this guy. <laughs> everything up until this point we checked every box like this guy likes wrestling yeah. he's all about the simpsons references we like we, right. we, we, we both love kevin smith we love a <laughs> lot of the same bands he's a gnr fan right on i like chinese democracy oh almost ruined <laughs> almost ruined an entire friendship maddie <laughs> okay have you listened to it more than once <laughs> Oh no, I don't think I've listened to it in in fifteen years. What? No. Okay. No. You I have to. Listen. If I could I... convince you to listen to back to back Killers albums, which I got... you did, and I and I thank you for. I yes. the, kill, the the Killers have become a a, a staple of rotation in my household. I absolutely so love the Killers. Yeah, yeah. And th th those yeah, two the Sam Sound album is unbelievable. Oh. Um, they're great, albums. but uh, yeah, go go listen to it, go listen to Chinese Democracy one more time just for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'll leave you with tonight. <laughs> well, my friends, thank you so much for humoring us and taking this little break from wrestling. Uh, 
It's not going to happen often, but it'll happen every once in a while. We'll definitely be back one of these days uh, with Sean Gibson to do a best of uh, the tragically hip list. Um, we'll see if I like Danny Parkin enough to bring him back for the hip hop list. We'll see. Um, or possibly I'll bring somebody who knows what they're fucking talking about when it comes <laughs> to hip hop. We'll see. I can say that because uh, only my friends listen to this show. So Danny has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> But thank you so much for uh, jumping down this 90s rabbit hole with us. We will be back with the Wrestling Talk next week. Um, I think we'll probably be hitting the double WCW list that Tyler and I have been preparing. Um, nice. The, the Who Killed WCW documentary just ended. I, I so just got into it, just started watching right. the first episode. I'm I'm enjoying it just because well, it's 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 just neat to look at this stuff again. Yes, it, it really is. is. Well, finish it off by next by next Thursday. Because we're gonna break it down. We're gonna talk about it right here. And then we're gonna do two lists, which is kind of cool. We're gonna do two lists in one show. Tyler's gonna break down the top seven things that killed WCW on screen. While I will count down the top seven things that killed WCW backstage. Love it. Um, we're really looking forward to doing that list. And of course, we still have my hometowns list to come. That'll be in two weeks. Until then, my friends, Matt Zucker, my thank you so much for uh, filling in for Tyler. Um, my pleasure. Hope, anytime. I absolutely love it when you're here because that means Tyler is not. <laughs> so. <laughs> I love you, Tyler. He buries me every time he brings people on. I hope you know this. I don't know he if does. you listen to his show when, when he brings people on, but he buries me every time. So I feel no guilt whatsoever. He, he tries to bury you when you're on the show. <laughs> no, very, very true. <laughs> until then, until Tyler's back on the show next week, on behalf of the amazing, refreshing, kicked up Cottage Springs, my friends, you have been counted out.